we have Andy Touch talking about mobile development with Unity. So let's give Andy a big hand. Cool, thank you. Um, right, so I've got a couple of questions uh, to follow on from Veli, uh, who talked last time. So who's actually used Unity before? Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, who's got the free version, just used the free version? What about the pro version? So it's kind of about 50-50 there. Who's made a mobile game with Unity? Okay, pretty cool. Um, who's released that game? Okay, cool. So you're just, yeah. <laughs> just keep your hand up for the next couple and then, yeah. Um, who doesn't know what Unity is and just kind of like stumbled in? Excellent. Um, and who stayed up all night? And they've gone to bed? Okay, just one. So if I see nodding off, I'll get someone to prod you or something. Cool. So. Um, we can expect this talk. You can talk uh, quite a bit about Unity, um, mobile inputs, demos, optimization, which is in general. So it's mostly for mobile, but also your own projects on standalone and web uh, can be put off across there. Uh, lots of pretty colorful slides, um, and probably me doing a lot of this, talking in my hands, um, which I'm probably doing right now, which I am. Um, I won't be talking about the whole our video games art thing, the finale of Lost, or first two being canceled. Um, so, <coughs> just a bit about myself. Um, my name is Andy Touch. And I have a sore throat. Um, no, I work for Unity and I'm a product evangelist. So I go to places like this, give talks, um, teach people, put people in contact with other people, and basically get people using it and buzzing around. Um, before this, I was a teacher, um, teaching Unity, uh, web development, video effects, mobile development, a whole range of things. Um, but in my evenings and sort of lunch times, I decided to like, make games and take part in game jams and LAN parties and um, just experiment with stuff, uh, muck around with like, Leap Motion, things like that. Um, before that, I was a cheese salesman um, for about four years. Um, that's not game related, but it's still on my CV. Um, I got to eat a lot of cheese, which is pretty cool. Um, I really like Dark Souls, and I'm really waiting for the new one. Um, it's pretty cool. Is anyone here a Dark Souls fan? Or? Two at the back, right, okay. Um, it's a great game for those people who haven't played it or don't know what it is. Um, I like TV, so I like math only TV shows when I have downtime, so I just sit there and watch like whole seasons of Mad Men or Breaking Bad, um, which is great. And um, I like challenging people to air hockey as well. So when I found out I was giving a talk inside like an ice hockey arena, um, I thought that was great. I was, and then I was wondering what, you know, how the desk's gonna work with all the ice, and I was quite upset when I didn't see everyone sort of scooting around. Um, but really, what I want to talk about, those things are great, and grab me afterwards if uh, you want to talk about Breaking Bad or anything, or air hockey and stuff. Um, but really what I'm going to talk about is Unity. So um, I've joined the company, and there's about 400 employees. Um, and Unity's goal is to democratize game development. So that's make, gamey, uh, make tools that are easy for people to use, ranging from any age from like 10 or younger to older um, and make it easy and fun, which is great because games are fun and they should be fun to make. So a lot of people always ask me, you know, is it a game engine? Like, what does it do? I've seen some stuff which aren't games and there's a whole that are games art and things like that debate. But really, it's kind of a development engine. There's a whole range of bits and pieces we've made with it. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples. Um, so the Shadow Gun, which is a, a nice little demo to prove that uh, you could use Unity to build kind of AAA graphics and put it on an iPhone, make it run Needs and tidy. Um, Bad Piggies, which some of you might have heard of, or um, no, no one's heard. Of it. Right, okay. Um, so it's a spin-off of Angry Birds that's made in Unity using its 2D uh, physics. Um, Lego Hero Factory. So Lego actually approached 42, um, who are a games company, uh, built up of ex-console developers, and said, "Hey, we want a game made in Unity." They actually said that. Um, which is Lego, and uh, yeah, we want it to be on iPhone devices and stuff. So they're able to use Unity's ability to build to different platforms to make like a web game, um, a standalone game, I think, an iPad game, Android, and so on and so forth. Um, Temple Run 2 was made in it, um, which I'm sure some of you have already heard of. The Android version of Temple Run, Temple Run 1 was made in Unity, but the iOS wasn't, so I guess they got converted or something for the sequel. Um, Castle Story, so you have all these little minions, and this was kick-started. Um, so they asked for 80 grand, um, and they got 700 grand, I think, by the end of it. So that's um, a fair bit of money for three guys. Um, Surgeon Simulator, has anyone seen this? Or Yeah, a couple of people. So 
The game kind of uh, parodies Team Fortress 2's uh, Meet the Medic, where you've all heard of Team Fortress 2, right? Yeah. <laughs> cool. No, it's not. So everyone's asleep already. That's all right. Uh, Meet the Medic. So it's made by uh, four guys um, in 48 Hour Game Jam. Um, it was really popular, so then they took 48 days to make it and sold it on Steam. Um, Valve gave them a load of assets so you could uh, perform surgery on the heavy character from Team Fortress 2. Um, and it also supports Oculus Rift, um, although it doesn't come with the bobbly eyes, um, and the Razor Hydra and stuff like that. So Unity is kind of in lots of different things, lots of different games, and lots of different peripherals that can go with it. Um, so sort of non-games is uh, NASA used it to visualize Mars when they sent the big robot up um, driving around. I don't think they could tweet from Unity, but uh, as it had its own Twitter feed, which is quite odd. Um, a cook and wheels do some form of educational fire safety. So what's doing a fire, how much water you should use, where you should spray it, which is pretty cool. Um, so kind of you can author once and uh, deploy everywhere. That's the ethic with Unity. You can sort of make this one program and sort of port it to lots of different things. I'll go through this bit pretty quickly. Um, cool. So yeah, standalone. So you can build for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Build to Steam. Um, you can build web, web browser. Um, so you can embed it in web page, even IE. Um, which is uh, quite impressive. Uh, um, mobile platforms, so it was just iOS and Android, but we now support BlackBerry, so you can build to that, and uh, Windows Phone. But I'll be talking about those two most simply because I don't have those two devices to show off. Um, so yeah, PS3, PS4, and the Vita, which is uh, pretty cool. Uh, Xbox 360 and the Wii U. Um, so yeah, there's a whole range of stuff that you can build stuff for. And yeah, but that's actually what I'm going to be talking about for mobile. So anyone who sort of stumbled in and said, oh, what's Unity? What's this thing? Hopefully that's a nice big uh, intro for you guys. So I'm talking about mobile. So I was going to do a different talk, and it was going to be about um, procedural art in games or something. Um, but then the 4.2 update happened. So uh, basic mobile license, you normally have to pay for that, is now uh, free. Uh, so real-time shadows is now free. Nav mesh baking is free, albeit they're all kind of basic. Um, you can now make a quad primitive, hurrah, and cancel button, double hurrah, which is cool. Um, so I'm going to be talking about mobile license. So some people with us um, making mobile license now available for free, like a basic version, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, and maybe I can you know, build some games for mobile and stuff. So this talk is like a crash course into that. So for five minutes, I'm going to show you all the different tips, how to do inputs with it, um, optimization, stuff like that. So this is kind of a checklist which, when people say, right, I want to make some iOS games. I want to use Unity because you rave about it all the time and you don't shut up about it. And uh, yeah, so what do you need? So you need, uh, if you make iOS, you need a Mac or a Hacken, Mac in, Hackintosh or whatever it's called. Um, you need a free version. You don't need a pro version. Um, device that you are building it for. So obviously, if you want to build for Nexus 7, get Nexus 7 or an iPhone. Um, you need Xcode, and I'll talk about that in a bit. You need Apple developer license. I think that's about $99 or 60 quid, which is about, I'm not sure how many euros that is, um, a year. And then that basically allow, gives you, Apple give you permission to build to a device and set up a device. Um, and you might also need some fingers as well, uh, which hopefully you'll have. Now, I was going to do a lot of building to iOS and building to Android, and sort of showing off, hey, look, you can build this to here, this to here. And then um, some nice guy hacked the um, Apple developer program, uh, with the network. So I can't actually set up any iOS devices to build to, which is a nightmare. So if you're the hackers in the crowd, um, cheers. Uh, thank you. Um, but I'll be building to Android, so that's all right. So you can still be able to see me tapping on screens and doing stuff. So if you want to build from you to iOS, you build a standard Unity project, but you switch in the player settings. So, uh, if I go into here. So when you go to your build settings, you have your big list. Okay, it might not be as long as that um, of here. And then you just choose iOS and switch platform. So when you build a standalone, it builds as a .exe or Mac or whatever that standalone build. When you do it for iOS, it builds something a bit different. So let me just open a project, an iOS project. Yep. So iOS project, I'm going to build it. So I'm going to give it a name. Append. So it does this. Oh, look, and cancel button as well. So I can cancel it if I think, oh, yeah, I forgot to add some sound or something. It builds it up. But instead of making it as a DXE, or if you do the web build, it makes it a HTML page and um, embeddable file. 
Uh, it makes a couple of other bits and pieces when it wants to do it. Please. Cool, right. So it builds a file, and inside here you have a whole load of bits and pieces. So if you don't set anything, when you go into the player settings and you set you know, sizes and things like that, um, if you don't choose any splash screens or sort of icons, uh, Unity gives it the default ones. Now you can either change this in the Unity editor. So when you have your uh, player settings here, you can uh, drag and drop in default icons. Hang on, I'll duck. So you could drag and drop in default icons, um, splash images, and things like that. But if you build it and then you forgot about it, you can click the cancel button, or you can do it all in Xcode, which I'll show you right now. So it builds you an Xcode project. So you open up that. If Xcode wants to open as well. I'm not having a good run, am I? So Xcode bridges the gap between Unity. So you have your project folder. you notice you have all your app icons, your launch images, and stuff like that. And if I had, if the guy hadn't hacked it, I'd be able to go to here, select Andy's iPhone, and then build directly to it, which is great. And then it will build straight through. So it's got this whole process of build from Unity. You get that bunch of files, take it at Xcode. You, you append those files, change you know, the app name and stuff. And then you run it, and you go to the iPhone. That's great. Android development isn't as sort of Bridge, bridge, bridge. Uh, you can use Mac or Windows. Uh, you can use free version, uh, device that you're building for, the Android SDK, which is free. Um, they don't charge you money for it. And uh, you probably need fingers as well. And you just build directly from Unity to Android. Um, so there's a click button. Instead of getting a folder, you get a .apk file. And then if you have an Android tablet plugged in, it instantly builds to you. That's say to Xcode or Android's own version of Xcode. So the first thing that I tell people is they always go, right. So making something for desktop, we have mouse and keys and stuff. That's very different from a screen, you know. And I said, no, it's actually very similar to web games, standalone application development. Um, and you can test most mobile games in the Unity editor. And a lot of people are quite puzzled by that. It's like, well, so they've released like touchscreens for Macs or something like that. And I'm like, no, you can use a thing called a Unity Remote. But um, no, we're not actually building to remotes yet. We're using Unity Remote. So this is an app that you can download on uh, Android, uh, Android or iPhone, and I'm sure there's Windows Phone, BlackBerry versions. And what it does is it allows you to run your game in your editor, but then use your, this as all the touch inputs. So the Android one, you need to be plugged in to do this, whereas the iPhone one is uh, Wi-Fi. And when you open up, it says something like this. It says, connect this device with USB cable to your computer and play the game in the editor. So if I do that, I've got a... Uh, very simple game. So I've got a very simple game. Now this is completely with all the code for this is all um, mouse clicks and raycasts and stuff like that. There isn't actually any code in here, and I'll show you in a sec, that is sort of involved with um, you know, touch inputs and stuff like that. So if I click Unity, I click these balls. Oh, fairly standard. They sort of bounce around. They look like grapes. And that's probably the highest score I've received in that game. You then click, you need to play again. So with the remote running, you get a feed there. So I can play this game completely on the editor. So the editor's running. Um, I can view it. I can test out all the inputs. Now, there's a bit of lag, because what's happening is that's got to send the input to there, and it's getting the display and then sending it back and stuff like that. So it's neat to test out things. So if you're testing out tilt, and I'll probably be doing this quite a bit. It's also a lot quicker than building it directly. So if I was to build that directly, and I'm going to switch projects. So I'm going to. There, and I'm going to build and run. So hopefully this won't take as long as iPhone. Um, so it'll build it, and it automatically open up the app on Android for you to play straight away. I say automatically, but um, yeah. <laughs> Cool. 
It's not my day, really, is it? <laughs> oh, yep, pushing new content to device, Nexus 7. Oh, yeah, so it'll open up the app straight away. Straight away. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. So we have our game. Uh, we can tap things. We have our game running. Dial it from there. And that's all code. No, don't power off. Cool. So that game there, I'll show you the code quickly. On the manager. So we've got uh, player control. So player control is um, a script which you know fires the balls. And you notice here we've got input.get button down fire one. Well, that's a mouse clear. That's pretty standard. And it sends out array to input.mouse position, stuff like that. But it still picks it up. It kind of converts it and says, oh, that's still a tap input. Um, on the button is an on mouse down. So you can do ma on mouse down stuff. So you think, oh, that's great. I don't need to learn any extra code. I don't need to learn extra C sharp. I can just go bleh, and then write it in here and then convert it. That's OK. Um, when I was a teacher, I had a lot of students who did that. But then they had, came into a lot of problems. Um, because relying on mouse inputs for fingers is a bit lazy, and it's kind of not right. Uh, you don't get a lot of things. So you get the tap, but you don't get things like hold and stuff like that. So what you want to do is you want to use a thing called touch phases. So if I open up the touch phases example. Cool. So I have um, a simple cube like this, and when I tap down on here, Nothing happens. I'm clicking, but it's not happening. That's because I've converted it from the code that was just, you know, all mouse clicks and things like that into touch code. And this is where giving this workshop is quite weird for my surname because I just end up saying and writing my surname quite a bit. So the way that um, I do it, each person has their own different way, is on update, I get finger count. So, so input.touchCount gets how many fingers on screen. So Nexus 7 um, supports up to 10 fingers. I think the iPad supports more. The iPhone, you can only fit so many. Um, so what input.touchCount does is if I have one finger, that'll be one, two, three, four. If none, it'll zero. So what I always do is I always do a check. I always find out how many fingers are on the screen. I then write an if statement because I don't want it to be constantly processing this code unless there's one finger on the screen. I then do input.getTouch0. So this always confused me. And arrays always confused me when I learned programming you know, like four years ago or five years ago. Um, because 0 is the first finger, and then 1 is the second finger, 2 is the third finger, and so on and so forth. So I'm getting the first touch. I can then do goo finger, do goo finger coordinates.txt, and first touch.position. So that gets the position on the screen. And then I'll do a touch phase. So touch phase is very important. And it's basically the bread and butter if you're doing you know, touch code and things like that. So began means it begins. Uh, we have ended. We have moved. And we have stationary. And they're all fairly self-explanatory. I probably don't need to sort of explain too much what ended does. So began when you touch the screen. Ended when you lift it up. Um, moved when it moves around. And stationary still. So began can be used for this cube. So if I go in here and I... Um, Run the remote. Cool. So I have the feed. Now, when I hit began, it changes color. And you notice that we also have the coordinates on the screen. So what it's doing is when the begin begins, um, the update is looping through and getting the position of the finger each time. And the coordinates are based on the screen. So the bottom right-hand corner, so right down here, is 0, 0. And I'll try and get it as close there as possible. My fingers are kind of chunky, so yeah. Whereas the top corner would be the far corner. So it gets wherever that is, and then you could do you know, a comparison, find out where it is touching. So that's began. And if I did something like ended, so if I go into the code and then uh, uncommented that. So began and ended. It's detected that began and ended of worked. Um, if you do uh, stationary, so if I hold it, you could change it to a different color. Um, or moved, you could swipe it around. So you could do that all sorts of things. You could have a game where you tap things. You could have a game where you have to release it. So on ended, you'd release it. So on began, it could, or on stationary, it could raise the power bar. And on ended, release, I mean, you fire something, um, Angbird or whatever. 
Um, so touchface.gan is pretty much what you'll need to use. So yeah, touch position, zero, zero, there, that's all right there. So touch area. So instead of just tapping anywhere in the grid, so like you want a GUI, so you, your lasers, you click lasers, you fire some lasers. You don't want it to tap the whole screen. You want it to be within that specific grid. Because for example, you might have three buttons. OK, maybe not all called lasers. Um, I guess I'm just a bit lazy. But um, you could have lasers, you could have boosters, you could have um, I don't know, uh, rockets, whatever it may be. So how would you do that? Well, it's kind of similar to Flash, where you do a hit test. So when you tap, you then work out where that GUI is or what you're referencing. And then you work out where you've tapped, and it gets the coordinates in there. So I've got a very simple game. So I've got a spaceship that's hovering. Um, I've got an FPS count. And I've got lasers. So what I wanted to do is, instead of tapping anywhere on the screen, you could fire lasers. You just tap lasers, and then you fire lasers from there. And you can see I'm testing it all through here. So if I built it, it would have be the same game. So how do I do that? Well, I'll show you exactly. Uh, spaceship control. Cool, so I'm getting a touch count as well, because I want on the first finger, I want it to you know, fire the lasers. I then if finger count equals equals one, so if there's one finger on screen, um, I get the touch. Um, I then do if first touch phase dot began. So if that laser begins, I don't want to, them to lift finger and then fire lasers. And laser button dot hit test first touch dot position. So laser button is a GUI that I just got stored at the top here. You could store, for example, uh, coordinates. You could store like a grid or something like that. But if I get laser button dot hit test um, first touch dot position. So like I used in the last script, first touch dot position gets the X and Y. In this, it's just in comparison. It's saying, okay. First such position is within this laser button. Fire the lasers. OK, cool. <laughs> no worries. OK, so that's cool like that. So what if I wanted to, um, hmm, what shall I do now? Let's have a look. Fire the lasers, yeah. So you could have multiple you know, GUIs and stuff like that. So another thing people ask is swiping. They said, right, that's OK. So I tap the screen. I can tap an area of the screen and stuff like that. What if I wanted to swipe in a direction, then something happens? Swiping games are very popular, like Fruit Ninja and things like that. So there are lots and lots of ways to do this. And everyone has their own sort of particular hack around and things like that. So say like you want to tap there, and then you want to detect if that finger goes right, or that finger goes left, or up, down, in a direction, stuff like that. Well, there's a thing you use is touch dot delta position. And what that does is it gets that point as zero, zero, and then when you move it, it works it out in relation to that point. So rather than that being the origin and then you do it around there, you can go zero, zero, and you move it left, it'll be minus 300 and then up 50. So you could do something like zero, zero, and then when x is lower than zero, swipe left, or x is greater than zero, swipe right, up, down, you know, all different directions. Um, and I've actually got an example of this right here. So our spaceship's pretty boring at the moment. It currently just sits there. It doesn't swipe. It fires lasers, which is pretty cool. Very easy game um, to beat because things will just come towards you. So what if you wanted to swipe and it would go in that sort of flow in that direction? Well, it's a channel art attack. Here's one I made earlier. And I've done it a bit differently from before. So I'll do the exact same thing. I'll log the finger count, so how many fingers on my screen. But what if someone has the finger on the lasers and one swiping? They don't want it to sort of only take one of them in. So what I do is I say, if finger count is greater than zero, so there's actual fingers on screen, then I run a for loop. So the for loop goes through how many fingers on screen. So in the, because it's an update and it's constantly updating, it's going to go through. So say like I've got two fingers. It's going to loop through and store those fingers. And it's going to for loop through those fingers. So I'm going to do current touch, input dot cut, get touch, I. So again, this is where my surname comes quite um, in use with this job, I guess. Um, so with current touch, we can then do all sorts of things. So having two fingers at the same time, it would just loop through and process what those fingers are doing. And I use a switch statement. So instead of doing an if, you know, a whole field of if statements, I can do a simple switch statement. So current touch dot phase, and if I say if it's phase began, and if laser button, hit test, fire lasers. 
or if it's moved and it's not hitting the laser button, because I don't want people to swipe on the laser button, I could do swipe direction, current touch. So swipe direction is just a simple vector two, and it's going to get the delta position of the finger. So if I put my finger there, that's going to be zero, that's going to be zero, that's going to be zero, that's going to be zero. Then if it's moved, which is what I've written here, I'm going to check the swipe direction. So if x is less than zero, so it goes that way, it's going to apply force left. If x is greater, apply force to the right. Now, the ship goes a bit mad sometimes. Um, so let's see what it's going to do. Right, so we have our super ship. We fire lasers, whereas if I swipe to the left, and if I swipe to the right, it's going to do that. So I've got to sometimes sort of bring it back. So you could do things such as, um, you know, you could say, instead of it just being less than zero, I could be, you know, less than 0.5, so only when they've swiped a certain distance, like that. And you notice here that this counter here has also got my finger. So if I'm swiping to the left, it's going to say minus, whereas if I'm swiping to the right, it's going to say plus, and it's going to apply that force to it. Now, you could do this up and down. You could do this sort of in a direction, things like that. Um, it's fairly straightforward stuff. So that's great. They say swiping is great. I can now go make Fruit Ninja. However, the next thing they ask me is tilt. So yeah, they ask me a lot of stuff. Um, so tilt is very, very easy to implement. And everyone's kind of blown away, but that one line of code gets in the acceleration of the device. So with your uh, Android tablet or your iPhone, um, you can do input to acceleration. It gets what tilt is. And I've got a nice little display in the corner. So currently, it's a 0 in the x, 0 in the y, and minus 1 in the z. Whereas if I pick it up, it goes a bit mad. So partly with designing your game, you're going to have to figure out what situation they're going to be in. Are they going to be in like that and turn it like a racing wheel? Are they going to be sort of looking down? It's like a marble maze. Um, or are they going to be like that and tilt it like doodle jump or something like that? So you kind of need to play around with it and sort of work out which value you want. So maybe if I want it, so I tilt it to the right. Or, hang on. So maybe if I tilt it like that, it's the x value that's changing. And it goes from 1, which is at absolute peak, 0, which is flat, minus 1, which is sort of the other way. So maybe I want it so that I tilt it that way, and the ship goes left and right rather than swipe. I can still fire. Oh, I can't fire lasers. Oh, well. So what I would do is just get the tilt vector, because that's a vector 3, and then just go and find out what value I want, so the x or the y or the z. And if I say x is greater than 0 0.4, so instead of me holding it and it's kind of going all over the place, it's after it sort of tilts in a certain direction, then apply the force. If it tilts the other way, then apply the force in the other way. So let's test that. So yeah, oh, oh Jesus. Hang on, let me just flatten out. OK, so x is the one that we're looking at. So if it's less than 4. I probably might need to smooth this out, but yeah. So if it's at zero, you know it's no force applying, it's just kind of floating because of physics. So if I go to 0 0.4, yep, it speeds up pretty quickly. Um, there's times when I was testing this and the ship sort of disappeared because I had the tablet sort of on its edge and it was like thousands of miles away. Um, so I just restarted it and made it go back to the start. So that's tilt. You can also detect that. Um, have I missed anything? So, oh yeah, I forgot to say, the asset store. So you all know the asset store, right? Yeah. So it's an online shop where you can go and you can buy assets. So that ship was from the asset store. That thing in the background, the space in the background, was from the asset store. I just went in, downloaded it, and then put it in my game. Um, a lot of people have come up with, you know, different versions of swiping. So they say, oh, instead of being tapped there, you can work out the speed of the swipe, which you could do yourself. But a lot of people find it easier to you know, buy a package, and then they have their own sort of scripts and things like that they can play around with. So it's quite useful. Um, the accelerometer, like I was sort of mucking around with it, it's sort of like this. Now, when I was teaching students, they sort of didn't really understand the whole concept of an axis. They said, well, if it's y, then it's how does it work? And I thought, right, if you take an iPhone and then put a pin right through it, that's the axis. So you have the Y, you have the X, or you have the Z, which just sort of turns around. So you're kind of going to have to play with it to see how your game is going to be when you design it. Um, and I've got one more little demo of touch phases. Cool. 
So we have a scene full of bottles that are floating, and that's got a... Uh, Unity Energy Drink, now with added mechanism fuel as well. So we've got a bunch of bottles that are sort of floating around in the midair. And if we have a look at this, they're just floating. So what if we wanted to interact with objects in the scene? So when I did touch phase and stuff, it was all within, you know, all within the screen. So if you want to interact with objects on, on the stage or in the scene, um, you can use a raycast, just like you'd use any other time. So if I pull that one up. So again, I'm just doing the same thing. So I get the finger count, and I'll store the first touch. So finger count, input dot touch count. If it's one, store that, and do the same thing, and began. Now I'm doing a ray. I'm sending a ray cast out from the camera, screen point to ray. So instead of input dot mouse position, which you do for the mouse if you're doing a point and click game, you do first touch dot position. So that gets wherever your finger's on the screen, sends a ray cast out, kind of like um, that guy from Star Wars who kind of just zaps everyone. Um, I've forgotten his name, which is quite embarrassing. Um, yeah, and then you just do a raycast, sends it out, and I've got a thing where it hits Unity bottles. So there's nothing really there that's much different apart from this touch business and this thing which I set up at the start of every scene. So I've got a nice little example where the bottles, and you tap the bottles, and no matter how far they weigh, they drop. And they've got some physics. And there's an undefined tag. Great. So yeah, so you just use a raycast like you would. So if you want to do a point and click game, you can point on the screen there, send it out, place a little flag, and then tell your dude to sort of walk there. You know you do all sorts of bits and pieces. Cool. So that's general inputs. There's a couple of other inputs, like joysticks, but they're pretty much like a whole 40 minute talk on their own, and I'm kind of pushed for the time. Um, so I'm next going to design considerations. So when I used to teach at university, I used to say, right, here's all the inputs, now go. And a lot of people assumed, right, I'm just going to take a big web game that's got you know, seven hours of play time, and I'm just going to stick it on an iPhone 3, which people will be able to play on the bus. And I said, well, actually, there's a couple of things you need to think about. And the first is physical input. That's the most obvious thing we do developing for mobile and designed for mobile, is that you don't have these anymore. You don't have joysticks. They're all kind of like fake joysticks. This is Dead Trigger, which is another Unity game. And instead of having you know, physical joysticks sticking out of iPhone screen, which be a bit odd and get in the way, they've got these fake joysticks. So you tap there, and then you, they do a delta position to work out sort of which direction you're facing in, uh, which direction you're going, and move the character in. That can be a bit odd and can be a bit strange. So you might need to think up sort of a different way to design physical input feedback. And I've seen these things you can stick on the iPhone, which gets where your finger is, which is pretty cool, I guess. Um, the other thing is screen real estate, which is quite a weird phrase to say. So um, in Tony Hawk's, um, you have this big screen. You're playing it on the TV. You could see all. You could say, right, I'm going to ollie off of that. I'm going to grind on that and things like that. So they port that out to the iPhone. And um, they don't have as much screen real estate anymore. Your fingers are kind of taken up by here. So if I have playing Tony Hawk's, I can't see sort of all sorts of stuff. I've got GUIs and stuff all over. I'm not bashing Tony Hawks. I'm just saying that screening real estate is definitely something you need to think about when you're bringing stuff over. So one solution is to perhaps make you know, the GUIs invisible or maybe sort of design a different type of games. You still have that skateboarding element, but you have your fingers there. Also, the GUIs are kind of scaled down a bit more rather than sort of taking up the majority of the screen. Um, the other thing is the player situation. Um, so. Not that, I'm talking about that. Um, so I live near London, I get the Chew quite a lot, and almost everyone is on their devices and phones because it's a nice little piece of entertainment to uh, pass the time between stops, a so five minute, 10 minute, half an hour trips and stuff. And I'm guessing you all take the train or have taken the train and you all play games like uh, Impossible Road or uh, Bad Piggies or Angry Birds and things like that. Um, so you've got to think about player situations. So keep the game time low and keep the loop of the game low so they get sort of the most enjoyment. I don't sit down on the tube, which is 10 stops, uh, 10 minutes, and play a game which takes me four hours to get into properly, like Dark Souls. Um, the other thing is hardware. So Unity has a section. So you go to unity.com forward slash hardware or something like that. Um, you've got hardware statistics to all the phones. So for example, the new iPhone comes out in the next couple of months or whatever it may be. Um, you might think, right, I'm just going to start developing for that. But there's still a lot of people with the older versions. So I'm still on a 4, and I've been on a 4 for the last year and a half or so. Um, 
And a lot of games are kind of not being supported for the 4 anymore. And they're saying, oh, yeah, you can't support. And I said, well, I'm only two versions behind. Um, so you kind of got to think about user base and things like that. So Unity has a big hardware statistics thing, which is very nice for you. And I've got 10 minutes. Cool. So uh, students come to me. They say, I made my game. I've put um, 150 lights in it. There's shadows everywhere. Um, I've got about 500 GUIs all around the screen doing stuff. Um, I've got 2,000 enemies because numbers, you know, Matter for everything, and I'll say, yeah, where's the optimization? Where's sort of like, you know, simpling it down? Um, I taught you this yesterday, which they probably weren't there, but uh, that's all right. And they say, well, I don't need optimization. And I say, well, optimization, that's the thing that you want to go at. You want to look at optimizing for your device. Now, this sort of next bit of the talk is aimed either at uh, standalone or desktop or web, um, and also iPhone. It's useful across the board, but it's more useful for mobile devices. So, one of the main things to look out for are draw calls. So this happens when a game object is rendered. Um, each texture requires a draw call, particle effect, emitters, draw call, and there's lots of different things sort of mount up to your account of draw calls. And it's fairly easy to find out how many you have in your scene. So this isn't that optimized scene. And if I run that, this stats button in the corner is really useful um, when you break it down. So I've got 64 draw calls. That's a combination of things. Um, I've got lots of different items. I've got lots of different textures. I have a point light, which sort of adds up how many draw calls there, which I'll sort of show you in a bit. Um, there's all sorts of bits and pieces in the scene. And toggling this is really useful. As well as draw calls, you can see how many tries. So I've got 34.6 thousand. So yeah, I haven't optimized that. Um, and I've got, you can see how many textures are used um, and all sorts of bits and pieces like that. So for example, if I tap that. Draw calls increase because the light is you know, now projecting onto, I know, more textures or something like that. So draw calls are something you want to look at and you want to sort of aim for as low as possible. So there isn't really a rough guide. There's lots of fishermen tales on the forum saying, oh, I managed to run a game with 2,000 draw calls on an iPhone 3. And someone's like, oh, no, you didn't. It's 25. And someone's like, oh, actually, I managed to run a game with 50. But this is sort of the general estimated amounts for me sort of just uh, browsing sort of the forums and things like that. But they're all really questionable um, amounts, and we don't really have a rough guide. Um, so that's for iOS. For Android, um, it's a bit more difficult because there are Android phones, um, more phones, more phones, more devices, more, and, um, and one more just down at the bottom. So the general advice is, um, to just aim for as few as possible, because trying to make a list of all these is you know, going to be a bit of a nightmare, trying to support all them. Just aim for as few as possible. Try and get that draw call mount down as low as possible. Um, and there's loads of different little tips and little things that you can click, which uh, sort of cut this out. The first one is static batching. Now, this is a pro feature. So anything that isn't going to move, anything like a wall, a building. So say like I had a game with this bottle that's stationary. Set it as static and make sure in the drop-down arrow that it's, uh, static batching is on. Um, this renders the object sort of all in one. And it shares materials and textures. It does a lot of processing for you. So if I go that demo. OK, so I've got um, probably the most basic scene you could have. I've got a crate turned on the side. Um, there's a point light sort of here. Um, and crate's got texture. And that's two draw calls. And that's probably because we're rendering this. We're rendering the object. And then we're rendering the light on top of that. That's two. And you think, oh, two, that's all right. That's not that much. Um, however, if we have more than that, so I add quite a few more crates. OK, that's not quite a few. but yeah. So we add more, that's now 12 draw calls. And bear in mind, these are probably very, very primitive objects. 12 more draw calls. Imagine you had hundreds more. Imagine you had like all these little details and things like that. Because the, each of those textures, so there's six objects, and then all six of those objects are being litten up as well. Um, so one way that you can sort of get away with, get rid of that, is to select your objects and go to this menu and just click it and set it static. So if I now run that, Oh, look, I've only got seven draw calls. That's partly because of light, but, but there's part the light for the six, but also there's one more draw call coming from, and that's from the texture. And you notice that it says saved by batching five. So what it's doing is it's rendering that texture, and it's going, OK, there's that one, that one, that one, that one. You've already rendered that. Kind of sort of apply it and batch it together. So the higher this number is, the better. The lower this number is, the better as well. So set your things to static. Now, if something's static, you can't move it by code. You can't sort of. 
um, you know, animate it and things like that. So you might want to just use scenery. Um, don't set your player static because they won't, you know, be able to wander around. Uh, yeah. Cool. Instantiate destroy is costly. So the first thing that everyone probably makes in Unity is make uh, click a button, a cube drops, and then it destroys itself because then that teaches you how to bring objects in the scene and get rid of them later and input and stuff like that. But that's very costly on a phone. You've got all sorts of things uh, such as the garbage collector to worry about. So if you're creating lots of objects and then destroying them, the garbage collector is going to have to come and scoop them up and sort of delete them each time. And what I recommend is to try pooling instead. So pooling would be a case of, in the start function, create how many you need. So say like this cluster is bullets, this is enemies, and this is um, explosion effects. What you might want to do is create all the bullets you can use, all the enemies you can use, and store them in arrays, and then use them. So say like you need that enemy to be over there, um, that enemy to be over there. You can say, right, use that enemy, make it active, refill its health, tell it to go there. Um, then when he dies, sort of push it back into that pool. So pooling is quite a useful way of doing that. That way, you're just instantiating them all at once. You're not getting rid of them later on. Uh, check your update. So what, when you create a new script in Unity, it all starts to a start function and update function. And a lot of people just leave the update in there, even if they're not doing anything, they're just doing collision code. That's kind of bad. So update runs every single frame. So what you might want to do is go through, check your updates, and make sure that um, you're not having stuff that's running every single frame, such as updating a GUI or something like that. And you only have the important stuff in there. Uh, get components very costly. So every frame, what this is going to be doing is going, right, traffic light color, find the traffic light, which is a sort of get function, get the component renderer, get the color, and then apply it if change lights is green. It's going to do that every frame. It's constantly sort of forgetting and remembering and reassigning it. So what you want to do is you want to move that somewhere it's not going to do that. So in start, it's just going to get the color at the beginning so it has it stored, then apply it later on. It's not having to do all this extra stuff. So like I was talking about before, lights and shadows are fairly costly. And what you want to do is you want to use light mapping. So I've got three minutes left. OK, so let me just check something. OK, so we have this scene here. Um, and using sort of Unity's nav mesh, we've got a little chap wandering around. He goes into shadows, gets darker, and stuff like that. This is 17 draw calls, but there isn't actually any light in the whole scene. I've actually turned off all the lights, and there's um, nothing in there. So I'll toggle that on, and uh, oh, you can't really see. So if I toggle this light on and off, it's not actually you know, making any change. It's giving the player a shadow. Um, a bit, pretty bad one. Um, but nothing happened. That's because what I've done is light mapped. So light mapping is a case of um, baking into your scene what lights can be. So you turn on the lights click bake scene, it goes through and works out all the shadows, and it generates a series of maps, depending on your side, size, of, uh, yeah, all of the positions of all the shadows. And then it sort of renders it on top of that. So you're getting rid of the light. So if I turned on the light and looked in our scene, yeah, we just cre decreased it by like nine draw calls, which is all right. Okay, a player gets a shadow. So um, yeah, so you could light map everything, take all the lights out, stuff like that. Um, so one game I worked on, uh, where you walked around in first person, you could paint on the walls, kind of like first person Microsoft Paint. Um, it was 3,000 plus draw calls, because it was rendering all these little objects which I was creating on the walls. So I light mapped the scene, set them all to not be rendered by a light, so we set them all colorful. And now that runs at 20 draw calls. So I could probably get that on my iPhone 4 if I really wanted to. So light mapping is really useful. Um, sharing your textures is pretty good. So this one ship model, um, instead of lots of different textures, is all in one texture map. And remember that one texture map is going to be rendered once rather than have you know, 20 different ones. Uh, transparency. So when you have normal opaque objects, they're rendered from the front and then sort of backwards. So that's right. So stuff you see in distance sort of won't be rendered. Whereas transparency kind of does it the other way. And so you want to look out for transparent objects. Reuse particle emitters, which I was sort of saying earlier on, instead of instantiating them each time. Compress audio, use audacity. Um, and I'm just about run out of time. <laughs> um, I'll quickly run through. So GUIs, there are alternatives. Test often. Use test flight. So you could send out a link to your friends, and they can build on their devices. So I've only got a Nexus 7 and an uh, iPhone 4. So if I want to test on an iPhone 5, I can send out a build to them using test flight. 
Um, the profiler is really useful. Um, so the profiler shows a running sort of timeline of you know, CPU usage, GPU, rendering, things like that. And then say like when you tap the screen and you make you know, something explode, it will spike. And then you'll be able to pause it and see what it spiked. And I've got a whole load of stuff where to go next. Basically, come talk to me afterwards, and I'll sort of point you where you need to go next. Um, so yeah, cool. Wicked. Sorry, that's kind of crammed in at the end. Um, I'll be on the booth sort of downstairs or wandering around for the next couple of days. So if you want to talk more about it, come grab me. Um, but yeah, thank you. <laughs>